Scum Art Theater. When Michael was four, his family moved to St. Petersburg, Russia, where Michael began his dramatic training at age 16. Michael's mother, Natalia Golden, he was her only son, was Jewish. The Jewish element in Michael's background was reinforced in his acting and teaching career in a series of collaboration with Jewish theater groups such as the Habima Theater, as well as theater managers and theater pedagogues. His close collaborator in the 1930s, Georgia Bonaire, was also closely connected with Jewish circles in the theater world. One more quick point. As a young boy, Michael, or Misha, as he was called, liked to put on various outfits he found in the house, transforming himself into different characters. Misha's best audience was his nanny, who would laugh until she cried, calling out, look what he can do. In his adult career, his ability to transform himself into a wide variety of characters was one of his greatest strengths. His uncle, Anton, said of him that he is a remarkably intelligent boy. From his eyes radiates sensitivity. I think he will grow into a talented man. <laughs> Michael Chekhov's uncle, Anton, had been closely associated with the Moscow Art Theatre until his death in 1904. In 1912, the Moscow Art Theatre or MAT company, came to perform in St. Petersburg, and among them was Anton's widow, the famous actress Olga Knieper. She was one of many women who played an important role in Michael's life. She introduced Michael to Konstantin Stanislavski and arranged for a successful audition. After the audition, Stanislavski famously said, Michael Chekhov, the nephew of Anton Pavlovich, is a genius. <laughs> From May 1912, Michael studied what we call the Stanislavski technique or method with Leopold Sulerzhitsky and the slightly older actor and director Yevgeny Vakhtangov, who would eventually become Michael's closest associate. From 1913 to 1927, Chekhov performed a series of increasingly important roles for directors such as Stanislavski himself, Vachtangov, and Richard Boleslavski, who came to America in the 1920s and made the Stanislavski method popular. We will return to two of Chekhov's virtuoso performances as the elderly toy maker Caleb in a dramatization of Dickens' Cricket on the Hearth and as Lestakov the lying, scheming, comic imposter in Nikolai Golov, the Inspector General, directed by Stanislavski himself. Both of these will be important in his work in America. He also performed Malvolio in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, a play he would repeatedly direct outside of Russia. Chekhov's life took a dark turn on December 30th 1916, when his beloved teacher, Sulejitsky, died, and then in 1917, he and his wife Olga divorced. They had a daughter, Ada. Uh, there was a Bolshevik revolution. His friends emigrated. His cousin, Volodya, committed suicide, and so on. Stanislavski gave him a year, year off, to get over his psychological crisis. But two things brought him out of what could have been career-ending alcoholism, a deep depression. What saved him was his good relationship with his second wife, Genia, Genia Ziller, whom he married in 1918, and the fact that he began teaching acting in his own private studio in his Moscow apartment. The first seats of what would become his pedagogical career. By December 1918, he is back on stage and as always changing himself into an astonishing series of characters. In 1922, Chekhov lost his dear friend Vakhtangov to an illness. 
At the same time, he discovered the religious philosophy of Rudolf Steiner, who called his spiritual science anthroposophy. Chekhov also embraced Eastern philosophy and yoga. After Bakhtangov's death, Chekhov became director of the first studio. In 1924, Chekhov performed the title role in a mystical production of Hamlet, which he also co-directed. Most critics appreciated the deep humanity of this new interpretation. An education commissioner, Anatoly Lunacharsky, awarded Chekhov a medal. But Stalin's colleagues began to criticize the spiritual undertones of his work. Also in 1924, he became the director of the semi-independent Second Moscow Art Theater. Here you see him as the youngest member of those directing the MIT. In 1925 and 26, he took his young company out on tours abroad as well as into the countryside, an important precedent for his work in the region. In January 1928, his autobiography, The Path of the Actor, was a runaway bestseller. Then, at the highest of his success, Chekhov's world comes crashing down. Rivals had denounced Chekhov as an idealist and mystic, producing alien and reactionary shows. In Stalin's Russia, this was enough to get him killed, and Chekhov became an unperson. Only with the help of the Commissar of Education, Luna Charsky, did he and Zhenya escape from Russia with their lives. We don't have time to go over his career in the early 1930s, except to note a few important points for his future pedagogical work. Chekhov worked with the great director of modern drama, Max Reinhardt, uh, through whom he met uh, a young Swiss theory theorist Georgia Bonnet, already mentioned. He directed Shakespeare's Twelfth Night for the Habima Hebrew Theater in Berlin in 1930, and in Paris, 1931, he and Bonnet tried to start a theater company with other MAT-related actors and with the support of Russian emigrants. From early 1932 through 1934, Chekhov worked in Latvia and Lithuania, where he performed as an actor in his native Russian language, taught at drama school, and directed in the national theaters. Consequently, overworked, he experienced his first heart attack. In 1932 33, Chekhov with the occasional collaboration of Bonaire, started to write a book in German titled Schauspiel Technique, Parisian Manuscript, 1932-34. He was directing in Riga, Latvia, and Kaunas, Lithuania. The artistic director of the Lithuanian Lithuanian National Theatre was Chekhov's former MAT colleague, Andrei Usilinski Olekas, Zhilinkas, who also taught and acted with his wife, actress and teacher Vera Solovia. At this time, Chekhov's own teaching began to be documented in notes taken by his students, as well as in a letter he wrote on the idea of theatrical atmosphere. These provide important early statements of his pedagogy and point directly to what he will teach at Dartington and Richfield. Unfortunately, in 1934, political events intervened to derail Chekhov's career. A right-wing coup replaced the Latvian government. The situation was not good for a Soviet Russian of partial Jewish descent. In August 1934, Michael Chekhov and his wife and his colleague Georgia Bonner would go to Italy, and then the Chekhovs returned to Paris. But Chekhov was always able to bounce back. 
In October 1934, he was asked by Russian-American theater impresario Saul Gurok. Some of you may remember him as the man who brought the Bolshoi Ballet to America to bring a troupe of Moscow art theater veterans who were also in exile to New York in 1935. They were to call themselves the Moscow Art Players in order to capitalize on the fame of the Moscow Art Theater. In February 1935, the Moscow Art Players appeared at the Majestic Theater on Broadway in a repertory season that included Nikolai Gogol's The Inspector General. Although the performances were in Russian, the acting, and above all, Chekhov's performance as Klostakov in The Inspector General was so spectacular that the New York theater world was hypnotized. Among those impressed was the American director, Robert Lewis, and the other members of the famous group theater, such as Stella Adler, who had actually studied briefly with Stanislavski. Chekhov repaid the compliments by providing two members of the group theater, Malide Thetcher Kazan and Mark Schmidt, a copy of lecture notes that Chekhov had made from his description of Stanislavski's system written in 1922. In addition to Richard Bolesowski, who had been teaching and publishing Stanislavski's technique since mid-1920s in America, two other ex-MAT colleagues were teaching acting in New York, Tamara de Karkanova and Maria Ospetskaya. Ospetskaya uh, was one of Chekhov's first private pupil in Moscow, along with Maria Knievel. Among the audience, were two young actresses, Deirdre Hurst, to whom we will return later, and Beatrice Whitney Strait, who was studying with Dave Karkanova and Ospen Skaya. Beatrice was the daughter of Dorothy Whitney Strait Elmhurst. Beatrice's father had died when she was young, and Dorothy had to be married to Leonard Elmhurst, an Englishman with advanced ideas about utopian com communities farming innovations, and the arts. The art program at Dartington was highly influenced by Leonard Elmhurst's international perspective and connections with the South Asian Indian culture. Beatrice Strait and Deirdre Hurst took private lessons in New York City in 1935 from Chekhov with Ospenskaya and De Karhanova translating. In subsequent discussions in New York and Philadelphia, Beatrice, Dorothy, and Leonard agreed to sponsor a theater studio at Dartington under Chekhov's direction. From the beginning, there was a great mutual understanding between Dorothy Whitney Elmhurst and Chekhov. Chekhov began immediately to work on a school curriculum and to learn English. Mm -hmm. Initially at the house of George Somov at Churaevka, a development of homes in Southbury, Connecticut, built by Russians. It is only about 25 miles northeast of where we are today. Somov would later become the studio manager of Dartington and Richfield. After a year of learning English, setting up the curriculum, and in the spring of 1936 at Dartington, England, training a group of students to teach his techniques, Chekhov opened the theater studio in the fall of 1936 with 22 students. The opening day was the 5th of October, 1936. Here you see him directing two theater pieces at upright and the students doing a study in group dramatic body sculpting and doing a dynamic exercise related to the quality and feeling of fly. Movement was an important means of channeling and finding sensations, feelings, and emotions. 
Other exercises developed at Dartington included, of course, the psychological gesture, and others aimed at encouraging strong, expressive gestures to trigger a thought, emotion, or desire in you. I always tell my acting students how Michael Chekhov often pointed out the old man in his Uncle Anton Chekhov's short story I'm citing here, who first stamped his foot and became angry. Words are so clever, but movement is simpler. Therefore, we can begin our work with movement, with psychological gesture. Your body must say the words. You all know many of the other exercises, such as the one at lower right to develop a feeling of ease on stage, to avoid psychological tie-ups, stage fright, and so forth. There were, of course, several exercises using balls from props to investigate communication between actors in a physical way. Chekhov's English sometimes betrayed him <laughs> as he wanted to start an interactive exercise and told the man in the group, now we will play with our balls. <laughs> However, by 1938, it was becoming clear that the gathering clouds of World War II would make it impossible to continue the theater studio in England. Chekhov and the, Dar and the Dartington trustees agreed to transfer the studio to America, especially since over half the students were American or Canadian. And of course, much of the money was already coming from American sources via the Whitney family. Notice, by the way, that Chekhov's arrival merited the attention of the New York Times. This slide shows the first group of students and collaborators at Richfield in early 1939. As you can see pretty well, all of the women and the non-British men from Dartington had arrived in Richfield and set immediately to work on their studies taking up pretty much where they had left off in England, increasingly joined by American and international fellow students. Chekhov is in the back row, standing second from left between Deirdre Hurst and actor Herb Hatfield, who would go on to a significant career in Hollywood. Beatrice Strait is seated second from left next to Zhenya Chekhov. At the top right, is the poet and playwright Iris Tree, who had been a famous artist model earlier in her career for artists such as Amadeo Modigliani and Augustus Jones. To find a location for a studio, Beatrice Strait took a plane from London to New York. The Richfield School for Boys of North Salem Road where some of you are staying, had just gone out of business, leaving classrooms and other spaces that could be used to create studio spaces, a dormitory and cafeteria with, as Deirdre has described, knives and forks and faded blankets on the bed and everything just waiting to be taken over. The main building is still as still there as the private house at the top of the hill with the upper floors now removed. As I mentioned well before, Chekhov and the students arrived. Publicity and brochures had gone out, explaining the studio and its curriculum. All of you have, of course, seen these images. Again, we must remember that Chekhov was the senior representative in the West of the tradition of Stanislavski's, Sulajitsky's, and Bakhtangov's techniques. He always acknowledged that his own techniques derived from theirs. However, he formulated these methods into a new system, one based more on imagination and creative intuition than on pure emotional memory. 
This combination attracted attention as student applications. The barn, like the gymnasium, was turned into the Elmhurst Theater and is, of course, still there. I took these photos when the former owner had it decorated as the gymnasium as it originally was. Have any of you uh, gone down to Late Mamanasco? Not yet? Everyone seems to have agreed that the location seemed to be ideal. It approximated the beautiful rural setting of the Dartington Hall and was only 55 miles from New York City. Before leaving England, a farewell performance was given by the students in Dartington in the middle of December 1938. Chekhov and his wife, Genia, sailed for America on 17th of December uh, of, you know, of 1938. Before they left, Dorothy Elmhurst sent them the following note. Beloved Michael and Genia, you have opened a new life for me that neither time nor separation can destroy. My heart is too full of gratitude to speak. Nothing can diminish the power of love I felt for you. Life is forever different because you pain. Herb Hatfield spoke about the 1938 trip to America aboard the liner Normandy. I'm citing. I traveled on the boat with Chekhov before we boarded. Chekhov was very nervous because back in Soviet Russia, they were shooting people, the distinguished ones, like the generals. He was afraid to walk his dog, and he said, you heard, walk my darling, my dog, Asif. But the dog tended to bite everyone. So I walked him, and he kept biting my heels. I have to say, that in this well-known picture, Chekhov seems a good deal happier than the dog. <laughs> <laughs> As you will see, Broadway productions were presented at the Lyceum Theater in 1939. Chekhov and the others wanted to start a young professional company in England, but the war ruined those plans. At Richfield, with its relative proximity to New York, the plan was taken up again. In the fall of 1939, they mounted a Broadway production at the Lyceum Theatre featuring both the students and older professional actors associated with the studio. The play was a dramatic piece based on Dostoevsky's writing called The Possessed, which Chekhov and his associate, the Russian writer, director, and filmmaker George Danov, had created in England. But Chekhov did not do what he himself had always done previously in Russia, tried out on tour before coming to the main theaters. It only ran two weeks. Still, the young professionals had made their Broadway debut, and a Richfield had sent a show to Broadway. From his earliest days, of independent teaching in 1919 to 1920, not to mention his work with Vakhtangov, improvisations were also a big part of Chekhov's training program, also in Richfield. This one was called the Subway. <laughs> we have quite a number of photographs documenting the life of students and members of the Chekhov Theatre Studio Company in the period of 1940 through 1942. Many of these were taken by Lonnie Gordon, who in addition to being a highly gifted photographer in her own right, was photographer Irving Penn's first wife. Here you see two female actors, Erica Kapralik Chambliss and Mary Lou Taylor, working on costumes while male actor John Flynn revises what seems to be a performance script or stage manager's book. 
all the acting students and young professional actors in the company did technical as well as performance work. Of course, as you know, the steps they are sitting on still exist. Mm -hmm. The photos labeled Nani are part of the University of Windsor. Thank you, Lion. <laughs> and Ontario Digital Archives. In this case, the Deirdre Hearst, the actor is the theater collection. Some of us from Misha, the Michael Chekhov Association, helped Jessica Searle identify the company members in the photos a couple of years ago. This photo of the three actors working on costumes and technical aspects of performance while living in the countryside, not to mention a similar situation with Chekhov's young second MAT actors on tour in the countryside, have led some to ask if there was any influence of Count Leo Tolstoy ideas. There was, of course, an influence of Tolstoy on all members of the MAT in its first two decades. Since Leopold Solerzhitsky had been a direct follower of Tolstoy, Solerzhitsky was a classmate of Tatiana Tolstaya, Count Leo Tolstoy's daughter, which led him into the Tolstoy family circle. Indeed, Solerzhitsky's first hopes for the MAT first studio were very close to the Tolstoyan ideal, a sort of theatrical commune. As close as Chekhov's social principles may have been to Solerzhitsky's ideals, neither of his Michael Chekhov studio locations was ever a commune. His students did form something like, um, like Solzhenitsyn's dream of a fraternal troop, fraternal troop. But at Dartington and Richfield, the studio was more like any other residential college. Any communal tasks, such as the ones you see here, arose from the need to <coughs> mount and tour theatrical productions. In fact, in Chekhov's pedagogical writings and lectures, Tolstoy is almost Taylor and Hurt Hatfield in the middle on top right, and Beatrice Strait on the far right with other Chekhov theater studio members. They are sitting with the Chekhov's dog, Bussy, mm -hmm. and her pups around 1940. Hurt seems to be keeping his heels well away from Bussy. <laughs> Tea time, some traditions did come over from England. You really get the feeling they had a very good sense of ensemble and fellowship in the company. Some of the actors were married to each other. Erika Kapralik, a Romanian, who was one of the original students at Dartington and Woody Chambliss, were married. They had long careers in Los Angeles after the war into the 1970s. Other couples had children. Here is Deirdre Hurst in white with the Schatz family and their children on Lake Mamanasco. Summer on Lake Mamanasco gave photographer Nani Gardner opportunities to use the actors as male models for uh, her photos. For Trainee, who had a repeated success in Hollywood films and television, was like the other man in the company in very good physical shape. He's on the left, left slide in these photos. On the right, Kurt Hatfield later famously played the lead in the film, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, 1945. Based on the Oscar Wilde novel in which a man's portrait ages in a closet while he stays forever young. <clears throat> One of the most unintentionally funny lines in film history was when Dorian, Kurt Hatfield, who's supposed to be going to a ball, comes downstairs in his dressing gown. His surprised fiance, already in evening dress, says, But Dorian, you haven't changed. 
<laughs> Presumably, the screenwriters and Oscar Wilde were making that poem. <laughs> These two photos by Gardner really capture better straight and dear to her personalities. Straight, impish, and playful, and hearsed, calm, yet determined, in spite of a broken foot. <laughs> As I have indicated, a very important part of the performance schedule and the training program was doing children's theater. Mm -hmm. Many of the pieces were written by authors in the company, such as Iris Tree. Chekhov wanted to develop young audiences for the sake of the future of the theater. In any case, in autumn 1940, the Czech Theatre Studio began an extensive national tour, 5,000 miles through New England, the Middle Atlantic states, the South and the Southwest, from New Hampshire and Vermont to Texas and Oklahoma, 15 states all together. This professional touring company was produced by Beatrice Strait, and managed by Strait and Alan Harkness. The Czechoslovak theater players performed in numerous civic auditoriums, opera houses, women's clubs, with theaters, museums, schools, and particular universities to sell out crowds and enthusiastic audiences. For two months, the company traveled by truck, bus, and car, while uh, Chekhov, who presumably will use his car to return to Richfield, stay back and work on his future book with Deirdre Hurst. Here is the first group that toured, toured in 1940. Second from left in the back row is Beatrice Strait next to Hurt Hatfield, and at right is Jenya Chekhov next to Blair Cutting, who would become an important teacher of the Chekhov method. Michael Chekhov, Eugene Somov, studio manager, and George Stanov are the last three in the middle row. The front row includes second from left, Alice Crowther, who taught Eurythmy and speech formation, followed by Alan Harkness, who would become an important California theater manager, and Fort Ray. An opening performance in the Richfield in the Barn Gymnasium, now called the Elmhurst Theater. The young company set off in November in cars, buses, and trucks. <laughs> the young professionals performed Twelfth Night by Shakespeare and The Cricket on the Hearth by Dickens. You will have noticed that these are the same place Chekhov himself performed in and directed in Europe. Here I compare Chekhov's 1940 performance as Gala in the Dickens piece and the 1940 Chekhov Theatre Studio production. The Chekhov Theatre players were finally able to demonstrate a way of playing the classics that seemed relevant to contemporary audiences. As for the technical aspects of the productions, there was a great deal of attention to detail and ensemble work. Before each performance, the actors are lifted together the golden hoop. Well, there was this great, great deal of attention on the ensemble. We have to mention the toys in the cricket on the hearth mm -hmm. that were designed by Michael Chekhov and painted by artist Bob Wundlach. And the students themselves. Remember that Chekhov had made his own toys when he did the role in the 1920s. Getting back to our photos from Richfield, here are some documenting the creation of costumes. Chekhov was a talented visual artist and often provided watercolor designs. Then, as you can see him, at the top, 
he was involved in the creation of the costume as costume mistress Ludmila Chinikova and an assistant fitted them to straight in summer 1940 for the first national tour of Twelfth Night. Below this, Chirikova herself is modeling the Sir Toby Welch costume. <laughs> By the time the next photo at publicity still was taken in 1941, a young Russian-born actor and circus artist from France, Yul Brenner, had joined the troupe. He still had the hair then <laughs> and was quite handsome. Yul Brenner played Fabian and is shown next to her Hatfield as Sir Andrew Adichie. Beatrice Strait as Viola and Fort Trainee as Toby Bellage are wearing the costumes. On December 2nd, 1941, Brinner made his Broadway debut in the Chekhov Theatre Studios hit production of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. In it, Brinner delivered only a few lines in his broken English with a noticeable Russian accent. This role helped to start adding English to the list of languages he spoke, which included French, Japanese, Hungarian, and some Russian. Here are two Chekhov's watercolor designs for the production costumes. Chekhov, in fact, went far beyond external elements in directing the production, expanding the ideas of centers to include imaginary centers, which would be located anywhere on the body or even outside of it. The imaginary center can be either static or dynamic. Check of the examples for the imaginary center in various locations, in the shoulder or in one of the eyes, Tartuffe and Fasimori in the stomach, Hosta, Sir Toby Belch from Twelfth Night, in the knees, Sir Agichi. Mm -hmm. Smartly, this time, something new happened in Chekhov's life. <coughs> this amazing postcard was sent by Herb Hatfield on July 30th, 1940, from Vermont back to Noni Garden in Richmond. Apparently, Chekhov, very smart, sent the cast of Twelfth Night up to Vermont to try out the production there, uh, before taking it, obviously, to Broadway. As you can see, the show was a big hit, with, as heard put it. Uh, this Tuesday morning, I had just finished performance in Vermont. Huge success, about 700 present capacity house. They laughed at everything. Shakespeare's jokes as well as ours. It was a circus. Theater, large and beautiful. Morning reviews caption, production triumph of dramatic art. Heard. Tell Fago. Anybody knows who that was? Can you identify Fago? Was it Chekhov's nickname? You need to help me here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they also added King Lear to the repertory. Chekhov had wanted to play Lear himself, but felt he was not given enough time to prepare the role in foreign language. Instead, he directed the play for his company with Fort Rainey in the title role. Chekhov particularly admired the way Yul Brynner invented his own makeup and created his characters. Chekhov also thought the play was an appropriate response to a world at war. In 1941, Twelfth Night Tour included a highly successful two weeks run on Broadway from December 2nd to 13th. Among the many things the critics applauded was the sense of inventiveness and ensemble creation in the performance. Working soon, soon enough, 
to the theater studio. While they were playing on Broadway, Pearl Harbor occurred. The last brief tour was in early 1942, by which time most of the men were either already drafted or waiting the draft, or like Brenner, already working in the communications efforts surrounding America's entry into the war. Several of the women from both Dartington and Richfield went to war. I'm showing you Mary Hainsworth, who served with the American Red Cross in Europe from 1943 to 1946, establishing clubs for soldiers in England and France, and driving a club mobile to bring entertainment and refreshments to soldiers in the field. After the war, she returned to the stage, participating in touring Broadway shows. Chekhov's last performance on stage was sort of a farewell benefit at the Barbizon Plaza Hotel Theater Auditorium in New York City in 1942. He performed in English for the first and last time on stage. Five former students from the Richfield studio joined him, including Walter Strait and Yuri Hurst. He and Donald did a one-act play taken from Anton Chekhov's text, I Forgot, in which an elderly man torments a shopkeeper by forgetting why he came to the shop. <laughs> the critics applauded the performance. Chekhov would use his monologue from I Forgot as his screen test audition in Hollywood. People in Richfield still remember stories about Chekhov. When I was first doing research in Richfield, the town clerk and archivist at the town hall, Ms. Barbara Serfilippi, told me about her dad helping Michael Chekhov moved to New York City in 1942, after the Richfield studio was closed. Another important gift, which his work at Richfield gave Chekhov, was the opportunity to compile and write down his teaching methods for future publications. Deirdre Hurst became, in effect, personal assistant to Chekhov. Her ability to take shorthand led Chekhov to nickname her the pencil. This allowed her to record his classes and lectures as an unpublished manuscript in 1942 called to the actor, which made possible all subsequent editions of his book, such as the 1953 publication to the actor on the technique of acting, Chekhov would create along with editor Charles Leonard, his Hollywood agent's husband, and with preface by Hill Brink. The final phase of Chekhov's career was his time in Hollywood, where uh, he would act in 11 films, teach, coach an important generation of American film actors, and publish the books documenting the theories and teaching methods. Here you see him in Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound from 1945 with Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. And in our time with actress, director Ida Lupino, who would send students to Chekhov. For his work in Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound, Chekhov was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. I'm now going to show you um, a clip uh, from Chekhov's film, Spellbound. I'm not going to show you all clips from all of his films, but I want to underscore the close connection between his acting and his teaching in Hollywood. For example, Gregory Peck also starred in Spellbound. He embraced Chekhov's techniques and was subsequently coached by George Zanoff and his wife Elsa in every film he made. Let's look at Chekhov's famous performance in a scene from Hitchcock's Spellbound, uh, one which came to symbolize his idea of psychological gesture, where a whole generation of actors now applied 
in acting in front of camera. As you watch, be aware that Chekhov had done many unsuccessful takes of this scene. Uh, but he applied the nervousness this created in making a wonderful psychological. <laughs> we are speaking of a schizophrenic and not a valentine. We are speaking of a man. Oh, poor boys. <laughs> a love. Look at you. Dr. Peterson. The promising psychoanalyst is now all of a sudden a schoolgirl in love with an actor, nothing else. Alex, let me tell you about him. What is there for you to see? We both know that the mind of a woman in love is operating on the lowest level of the intellect. Doctor told me not to smoke in the morning, but I'm too excited. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> when Chekhov finally did uh, complete the scene, after the many takes, the technical crew broke out into applause. In fact, Chekhov used the crew on a movie set as his audience. <laughs> Among Chekhov's most loyal students in Hollywood were Anthony Quinn and Jack and Virginia Palance, here watching Chekhov demonstrate how he grows or transform himself to seem taller than he was. I want to thank Lisa Dalton for the Anthony Quinn interview about Chekhov she produced in 2006. We will see uh, another uh, sort of different version here which I would like to share with you. Quinn and Patricia Neal tell an interesting story about Gary Cooper's use of Chekhov's technique while filming The Fountainhead. Cooper was having trouble with one scene. They apparently did something like 50 takes. They stopped filming and took a break for lunch. During the break, Gary Cooper hid himself behind a large tree. He stood there and did this Chekhovian exercise. Um, about which he was very skeptical in class. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm going to tell you about Chekhov because he's a whole, whole, whole book. He had a wonderful theory. I mean, and I must, if, if any of you can use it, it's separate from Michael Chekhov, not from Anthony Quinn. He said, down in the center of the earth, way down below, it's a great. Yeah, I just picked yeah. this up, but I don't think. Uh, no, everything is fine. I see it here, but here it's a bit problem. Yeah. 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 Coming up, and now they're to heels. Now they're coming up the right leg. Now they're in the hips. Now they're in your stomach. Now they are in your chest. Now they are coming up your neck. 
in your head and suddenly they are in your arms. And you send it out. And you give the message. That was a, he talked to that energy. And I must say, there's a time when I get on the stage that I don't do that. Send that down to you. Come on, get up. Get up there. Yeah, yeah. Wait up. I'm the dark horse and thank you so much all of you it's a great great thrill for me and very unexpected though I should have known that when I had someone like Paddy Chayefsky writing and saying things that we all feel but can't express and when we have someone like Sidney Lumet who makes one want to act forever and a producer like Howard Gottfried then how can I miss? But I know that my mother would be delighted. She had great potential for an actress, but didn't think she should do it. So she pushed me and was delighted. And Michael Chekhov, the great actor and teacher who I studied with, who gave me a love and respect for the theater, which is the whole point of why we're all here. It's a great profession, and we have to keep thinking it all the time. And we all do, and we all love it. And I'm so grateful for that. And for a wonderful lady, age 93, who lives here in Los Angeles, who's watching tonight, one of our first women directors who directed Paul Robeson in Othello in London, Ellen Van Valkenburg Brown, bright as ever, thank you. And last but not least, my husband, who's put up with me for 28 years. Thank you so, so much. Still the shortest uh, Oscar winning. Yes, five yes, minutes. Yeah. Shortest scene. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So uh, here I'm going to progress to another slot. Um, and here we have another group of amazing people from the Hollywood group. There are uh, wonderful actors. We all know Joanna Merlin. We're all thinking of her. Mala Powers, Frank Lisa, James Dean, Jennifer Jones, Lloyd and Dorothy Bridges, Robert Stack, Clint Eastwood. And to these, we could add Rock Picture, Sterling Hayden, Burt Lancaster, who occasionally disagreed with Chekhov, mm -hmm. <laughs> Rex Harrison, and of course Marilyn Monroe. Beginning with uh, Straight and Brinner, from the Richfield group, 
Chekhov's pupils won more than 18 Academy Awards. The list of Tony and Emmy Awards is even longer. I'd like to share with you what you already know, I'm sure. Marilyn Monroe was an extremely loyal follower of Chekhov, who left money in her will to Chekhov's widow, Jenny. She said, and I am going to ask you to read it, and we're going to read it inside. Chekhov's death, George Zhanov remembered asking Chekhov, Nisha, what we're doing here in Hollywood? We didn't become involved with the theatrical profession to make better actors for Louis Mayer. <laughs> Chekhov answered, we're not making better actors for Louis Mayer. We're helping people to grow spiritually and become better humans. Chekhov was a human being of a great resilience. The influence of Michael Chekhov's teachings is truly global, international. Richfield should be proud on hosting such a personality from 1939 to 1942. I feel that it is wonderful to continue the tradition and celebrate Michael Chekhov and his genius, his influence on the art of theater. And now, let me leave you with Michael Chekhov's own words. Deep, deep within ourselves, within the treasure house of our souls, are very specific, but they remain unused as long as we do not know about them or as long as we deny them. They are so powerful, so beautiful, wonderful, that we are, and this is the disease of our present age, we are ashamed of them. That's why they remain unused and uh, would remain forever if we would not open the door, go fearlessly into this treasure house and search for them. Thank you so much for the opportunity.